this morning. And uh, morning to those of you who are on YouTube. It's great to have you with us or listening via WhatsApp Church later in the day. We are starting a series called The Good Fight. Living victoriously in a world of demons, curses, spirits, and unknown forces of evil. I really feel that this is going to be a significant series for us. This is an important area um, that we need to study in the Word of God. And we're going to take um, a couple of weeks to talk about the Scriptures that give us such wonderful hope in this important area of our lives. I'm aware that as we do it, I'm going to raise a lot more questions than I answer. And this week, we're going, to, we're going to just do an introduction. So if by the end of today, you're like, well, what about, well, why didn't he, or maybe there should be, it's an introduction. And what we want to encourage you to do is throughout the course of today to text your questions to 060-644-0857. That number should be coming up on the screen during the course of of the, the message, 060-644-0857. Text your questions, and if I don't get to actually uh, answer them directly, we will answer them in the course of the series, and we want to see what's happening in your world. I want to talk to you about the forces of evil, about demons and devils and spirits and Forces of darkness in our world. Sounds like fun. Um, Sounds like going to be a good day in church. But first of all, I actually want to talk to you about what I've learned about this stuff from township dogs. Does anybody have experience with dogs in the township? They're not normally great experiences, if you know what I'm talking about. And so I had a lot of friends in the township when I was uh, living in another city, and I learned that there's normally two kinds of dogs that confront you in a township. Do you, maybe you know this, uh, this kind of street wisdom. There is, first of all, the small yappy dog that makes more noise than it has bark. You know those little um, in Afrikaans, we call them stoop blafferkies. They, 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 like, they, they sit on the front. It says that they sit on the front door, and they just make a lot of noise. And they run, and they bark, bark, bark. And you know that that thing is making more noise than it has the ability to bite you. <laughs> Category number one. Sometimes the devil is making a whole lot more noise than he has potential to damage you. And he uses intimidation. He wants you to overbelieve in his power. Uh, Spiritual forces want to boast about things that they can't do, threaten, intimidate, create a culture, a climate of fear within your home, within your community, so that you feel intimidated, but it's actually a tiny little dog that if you were to run and give it like this, those two plafrikis run away. This is what I used to do. Just, yeah, and and then they're off. Then there's another category of dog that I call silent but deadly. You know this dog in the township? I think it's normally, in my experience, the dog that makes no noise that's the troublesome dog. You know when he's just checking you out? He's like, I'm not going to let you know I'm coming. I'm just going to bite you. And they're looking and they get that low growl, that just that low growl, and then you know you're in trouble. And there's another way that the devil gets us, and that is when we think that he doesn't have any power at all because he's just sitting there quietly, and we get arrogant and then we get in trouble. And I think that those two errors, to overestimate what powers of evil can do is a problem. And to underestimate what powers of evil can do is a problem. And so I'm hoping that during the course of this series, that what will happen for us is that we rightly estimate things in our world. We have a right sizing of things. I'm going to read a beautiful scripture to us in Colossians chapter 1. Those of you who love the scripture, who are Bible readers, who are version app enthusiasts, get your version app open, uh, turn to Colossians chapter 1, or in your paper copy, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, you can put your finger there, and I'm going to read it in a moment. But I want to begin by introducing this, uh, this to us, and um, I'm struggling here, guys, I'm sorry. The media guys, you're going to have to solve this, because I need this closer to me. Is that okay? If anyone wants to come and adjust it from the booth, just make it work. I need to be close to this. And so, so I want to talk to you about the Greek, the Greek worldview. Um, the Greek worldview had all sorts of uh, spirits that dominated human affairs. I'm just going to give them different shapes, you know. And so... They had all of these spirits 
that dominated human affairs. If you, if you had, uh, if you were going to war, you needed the god of god of war called Mars on your side. You need to go and make a sacrifice to the god of war called Mars. If you were uh, in love, you needed the goddess Aphrodite on your side, from which we get uh, the commonly used word aphrodisiac. And so she was the god of love and sex. Um, if you were starting a business, you needed the god, which was also very much known in the Greek world, pagan god called Mammon, the Greek of money, material things. And so there were these spirits that governed um, different parts of human existence, and different, they made sacrifices in different temples. There were many, many more than this, and this is the mixing of the Greek world, the Aramaic world, the Jewish world, had all of this sort of mixture. And then they also saw that there were spiritual forces governing um, even sort of things like politics. So when Rome was winning its battles, they believed that the goddess Roma was greater if they were fighting the Britons than the goddess Britannia. And the fact that the battle was won on an earthly plane was, the fa- was coming from the fact that the goddess Roma was in that moment fighting against the goddess uh, Britannia. And so what was happening is that that this spiritual world was quite chaotic because there was fights and there was relationships happening here. If this God was fighting with this God, suddenly all of your crops didn't grow. If this God was fighting with that God, suddenly your marriage fell apart. If you didn't make the right sacrifice to this God in this time or to these spirits, uh, then something else will happen. And the Greeks took it even further that they said these gods had sex with each other and they gave birth to children. And that was one of the ways that life um, advanced. And so there's this, there's this, like all of the things that you know about human relationships. There's confusion and deception. There's this unpredictable, chaotic world that, 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 that was in play. And the bottom line is power. This is the bottom line. You've got to have power. You've got to go with whoever's in power in this whole mess. If this guy's in power, go with him. If this one looks more powerful, quickly sort it out. Uh, you better use some other powers to, to make sure that you don't become a victim of these warring forces. And the problem is that no matter how hard you try and manage it, every now and again, stuff just gets out of control. A baby dies. Uh, you, you, suddenly, there's a drought. There's a famine. Suddenly, someone attacks you and you don't understand why. And then you're going to have to start the whole process over and over again. And so what this worldview produced here was a very, very deep and prevailing sense of insecurity. You never knew what was going to happen. Sometimes there weren't even causes for it. And then, you know, subsequent to this, with, you know, sort of the development of history, and this was just sort of one prevailing part of the world, and we're going to read what Paul says to the Colossians. We, 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 we have dealt with this by saying, well, into this chaotic world, we actually need people that know us, that trust us, that determine our lineage, and that represent us. We need, we need our people, uh, our community, as they die, that they would go into the spiritual world, that they would order things rightly, that they would produce a moral world for us. We need to, to have our own representatives in there. And so, so you may, depending on how you grew up, you may be more or less connected to this way of seeing the world. A lot of people, uh, like myself, have grown up in kind of a secularized view of the world, by which I mean that the world in Western thought has been divided into two parts. There's secular and there's sacred. And religion is not something that's real, and spiritual, the spiritual world is not actually something that's real. It's just kind of a way for people to deal with their emotions. And so a Western worldview would very much say that all of this is superstition. It doesn't exist. There's no realities here. And yet, Western people use words that speak to this kind of thing all the time. Have you noticed? When you watch the news and they're interviewing people who have three or four PhDs in areas of economics and politics and social policy, and they say, why is our world so out of control right now? And they say, we don't know. It's, uh, it's like there's these economic powers at work. They say, how come suddenly we are in the most divisive age of history 
where there's the rise of nationalism in Belgium and France. There's incredible racism in every country on the planet. For some unknown reason, this is all happening at this time, and they say, we don't know. There's some kind of forces, political forces at work in our world. What are these forces if they are not spiritual beings, spiritual things, if you like. I don't want to say beings necessarily, but there are things to which the secular worldview doesn't want to admit that they are real, but they are yet shaping our world. And so for, for everyone, no matter, no matter how we construct our world, uh, it's all kind of out of control. Everybody's feeling this sense of insecurity here. That no matter how hard we try, there's stuff that's fighting in the opposite direction. Do you relate to this? Sometimes you do everything right and you didn't mess anything up and things go wrong even though you were doing everything right. Why do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? Why is it that the person, there's one person in this church right now who has had six people in their, sorry, Nine people in their family die from COVID-related illness. And they, they love Jesus, and they've been serving in healthcare. And yet the person who, got, who went out every Saturday night partying without a mask on, they don't even contract the virus. Why does that stuff happen? There's <laughs> this sense of, of, of it all being so unjust and being unfair. And I'm going to get to some of these questions as we go along. And so, so we have this sense of being out of control. I want you to read these incredible words that Paul writes to the Colossian church, to people who had this worldview. And this is a poem about Jesus Christ. And it says that the Son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation, for in Him all things were created. In things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He, Jesus, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I want to unpack this poem for us for a few minutes and uh, hopefully get to some other scripture as we respond to how Jesus informs this problem that we have in our world, informs our understanding of it, rather. First of all, this poem says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We've got to understand that Jesus would be absolutely no good to us if he was kind of a messenger, a prophet, a good person, a teacher. Jesus never claimed to be those things. That's what other people called him But he was very clear about his identity, that he is one of three persons of the Godhead called the Trinity, and he is God in the flesh. When you look at the reality of the Father, he is reflected in the image of the Son. And so, the Christ event, the the fact that Jesus came and walked and lived on our earth, means that we have seen and known in history that God is real. And so when we put our trust in Jesus, he's not a Jewish God. He's not a God of an epoch of past history. He's certainly not a white Western colonial uh, deity. He is the representation of all mankind, and he is the representation of God to all peoples on the earth. He is the image of the invisible God. And this guy's just trying to underline their confidence. He's like, whatever your cultural background, however you've grown up, I want you to know that there has been a revelation from God that Jesus Christ is above this. He is the image of the invisible God for all nations and all peoples and all time. And it says that all things were created by him and for him. In other words, uh, it's not a case of there are good, there's good forces in the world and there's evil forces in the world. There's There's kind of an Eastern worldview that would talk about those two things having to be in careful balance the whole time. 
And, and so, so this chaotic worldview where there's good and evil forces, he says, no, no, okay, there are evil forces in our world, but he is above and before all of these things. And all things were created by him and for him. In other words, there are evil forces in our world. If you want to read in Revelation chapter 12, you see how the scripture reminds us that a third of the created beings called angels rebelled with this angel called Lucifer or Satan against the creator, and they fell. They were cast out of heaven, and from there they became forces of evil. And so it's very important for us when we begin talking about the spiritual battle to understand that whatever we are fighting against, it was ultimately originally created by God. If he built the computer, he can pull the plug on it anytime he likes. If he gave birth to it, he can kill it if he wants. There's no equal and opposite forces to the creator of the universe. There is only creator and creation. And that means that there's a very different way that we fight our battles. More to say about that as we go along. And so what has happened is that the fall, when we rebelled against God, it wasn't only my, uh, this, this uh, angel, Lucifer, who rebelled and the angels who rebelled with him, but they tempted our ancestors, Adam and Eve, to rebelling against the Creator as well. And when we rebelled, we fell as well from our place of glory and authority. And so we entered into this way of life called death, and we handed over our God-given authority to other powers. Because we were no longer under the authority of Jesus Christ, we, we, we handed over our authority to these other powers to protect us and care for us and provide for us and give us dignity and meaning and value and worth, and we now became victims and players within this space. But Jesus Christ has come and he has died for us on the cross. And as he was raised from the dead, his death, Paul is writing, has, if his death paid the price for our sin, so we are now free from the wrath of God, which is the devil's only tool that he can keep us separate from God. And not only that, but he has conquered those powers because he has been raised from dead, death. And so he is the firstborn from among the dead. That's what we learn in this poem. He is the firstborn from among the dead. Um, if you are the firstborn in your family, it means that you look after everybody else, right? And in the Jewish culture, to be firstborn meant that you cared for the rest of the family. If Jesus was raised from the dead, he's taking his whole family with him. But there's a more important context for that word. The firstborn and the first fruits was something that they offered, and they said if we give our firstborn lamb or we give our firstborn crops, the rest of the harvest will come. If Jesus has conquered death, you will as well. And all of the powers that have caused us to become subject to death are also conquered by him. And so we don't need to submit to these powers anymore, but he comes full circle and he says, actually, all of these things, he will reconcile all of these things through his death on the cross. Let me read to you one more passage from, from here, and I'm going to go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Colossians 2 and verse 15. Uh, you can just skip to that verse. I want you to underline this in your Bible. I want you to write this on your wall. If you're having bad dreams, I want you to stick this as a sticker next to your bed. I want you to highlight it on your phone. I want you to read this scripture before you go to sleep. If, if you feel like someone has cursed you or cut you off or there's some evil cycle that's repeating itself in your life, listen to the words of two, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. He's writing to, into the same book, the same people. He says, having disarmed the powers and authorities. If they don't have any weapons, how will they fight? He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The picture in terms of a battle is he takes the guns away and he ties them up and he brings them into the public square and he says, you will not, you don't need to serve these powers anymore because I have defeated them and I want everybody to come and watch. I want everybody to know he made a public spectacle of them when he died on the cross and he was raised from the dead. These need not be your powers anymore because I have forgiven you and I have triumphed over them as 
your Savior. And so he concludes in Colossians 1 and verse 13 that he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. He has rescued us from what? The dominion of these dark powers, this chaotic world. It's not a kingdom. It has no order. It's a dominion of of dark powers, and he has brought us into the kingdom of of the son he loves, a place where there is moral order, where there is a vision for your life, where there is a loving heavenly father that is directing your life in a good direction. And so, so what is, what is this, the conclusion of, this, of Paul's passage here? It's so important for us to see this. He says, he says, first of all, what happened was, one, we handed our lives... To these powers. Right? This was an intentional decision of our will. We rebelled against God, and so we became slaves to these powers by sinning against God. And so, so here we are slaves to these powers because of sin. But secondly, we now submit to Christ. We submit to him. The scripture calls this repentance. And that says that my biggest problem is not with all of these powers that dominate my life. My biggest problem is that I haven't let the creator be my God and be my Lord and govern every area of my life. And so in repentance, we ask God to rightly reorder our lives. And so then what happens is when Jesus died on the the cross and and was raised from the dead, Jesus' death and resurrection means that the powers submit to Jesus. That's exciting, right? But let me show you something more exciting. Number four, now Christ is in us, and the logical conclusion, these powers now submit to Christ in us. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ is to have His Spirit inside of you and to work alongside Him in reordering the world and causing the rebellious forces of evil that govern our world to submit to Jesus Christ and for everything to come back into its rightful order. When two people are fighting and they've stopped talking to each other and you get in the middle and you say, Christ teaches forgiveness. Why are you being so proud? Why are you not seeing things clearly? Let me work for reconciliation. You are taking authority over a spiritual force that causes division in their lives. It doesn't mean that there's a spirit called division. It means that there's a spiritual force that's very complex. We'll get get going with this as we go along. You don't need to name that spirit or bind that spirit or ricochet against that spirit. You just need to know that there's a spiritual force there, and you say forgiveness works reconciliation. When you as a man refuse in your circle of men to allow sexual jokes to be told or women to be demeaned in someone's home, you, you are undoing the spiritual forces that are behind gender-based violence. We had a WhatsApp conversation within our, our complex the other day where a number of people who were Christians started to challenge a spirit of racism that was very subtly working its way through that WhatsApp group all the time. We were busy decolonizing our WhatsApp group in the name of Jesus in a very gentle and powerful and gracious way. And there were white voices and there were colored voices and koi voices and Indian voices and black voices all speaking the same message. Jesus Christ does not want human beings to be shaped by a spirit of ethnic and racial division that has caused power disruption in our world. We take authority over that spirit and we cast it out of this Sphere of influence. You may still make that your God, but he is not going to say how things are done here. 
And by the way, do you see how small you have become as you have made yourself a slave to a spirit of racism? Ours is to walk in his authority. When he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, therefore, go and make disciples. As we make disciples, our discipleship is standing in, taking authority over powers of darkness in the name of Jesus. And so I want to give us just three applications today. Um, And I think... What I'll do is uh, I'm just gonna give it. I'm gonna give it my best shot, and if I don't finish, we'll finish next week. Is this helping you so far? Amen. Application number one: If you're taking notes, first of all, this means that we do not need to deal with these powers at their level. We do not need to deal with these powers. At their level, I want you to read with me Matthew chapter 12 and verse 22, where they brought to him, it says, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judge. But if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man, then he can rob his house. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through and seeks places of rest and does not find it. And then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that man is worse than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. Jesus is giving us incredible insights here. And of course, he's talking to how a spirit of, of, of religion in the Jews has made them totally dark and evil and resisting God. And he says, your life is like a house. This is your house. And he says, you may have, there, are, there is a way that you can choose to manage your house. If you have all sorts of stuff in your house that you don't want there. Your house meaning your life, your sphere of influence. That this is this is physical, spiritual, emotional, economic, relational, okay? It's everything. This is your house. He says he says you have stuff in your house. How many know that that God is not the only one that is affecting stuff that's happening in your house and in your world and in your business and in your school and in your neighborhood? There are spiritual forces at work. And And Jesus gives us a beautiful, beautiful teaching here. Because these guys came to him. They saw him drive a demon out of someone. And they said, whoa, that's awesome. Now tell us, Jesus, which of your power, which powers are you using to drive these out? Because they had this worldview that we, we we were looking at over here, right? They had this worldview. They're like, okay, we know about these powers, right? So which one is your big one, Jesus? Yours seems to be pretty strong. Can you tell us? Is it, is it the prince of demons? Is it Beelzebub? Is it somebody else? Who's your power? Because we want to use that power too. Because you know how it is, Jesus. You just, you know, there's powers. They change their minds. Sometimes one's on top, one's. So show us yours. Teach us yours. Show us your technique. And Jesus says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. If you want to use smaller powers to drive out smaller powers... You're always going to have this division. 
It's always going to be a war. It's always going to be a battle. Somebody's always going to be on top. Someone's always going to be underneath. There's going to be this fight that's going on. You're using smaller powers to try and drive these things out, but a house divided against itself will never stand. And isn't it interesting how often when we go to spiritual practitioners, the message is always divisive, isn't it? And the message that comes back is, this person is your enemy. They have cursed you. Or there's a suspicious enemy in your household. And you say, who is it? And they're like, no, we don't tell you that stuff. And now you go home with suspicion. Is it my mom? Is it my aunt? I knew. I knew I should have paid more for La Bola. You know what I mean? Uh, what happened? And now there's suspicion. There's division. This person is against you. I'm, I'm not meaning to make light of it. I think that there's a very, very powerful deceptive force that's going on there. And Jesus says, you can manage your house like this if you want, but your house will always be divided. But then what he says is, there's another way that you do it. And what you do is you just put one strong man in the house. And Jesus Christ is that strong man. And then he says, nobody's going to come into your house or near your house because it's now Jesus' house. And they're going to have to tie up the strong man. And they tried at Calvary. And the forces of darkness put him on a cross. And every powerful curse that could be gathered against the Son of God came like a storm cloud above his head. And the devil rejoiced and said, God is finally vulnerable. Our powers of darkness will win. And they bound him and they killed him and they put him in the grave. But they didn't know that you can't destroy the author of life through death. And when he came out, he said, I will not be bound. This world is my house. These people are my people. And everyone who invites me into their house, I will never be bound. You cannot bind me up. I am the strong man. In their house. And so we have two ways that we can manage our house. We have a way that constantly creates insecurity and division. Or we have this way that just creates real peace. Real peace. The strong man. The strong man. The strong man is in my house. Let me just tell you a story quickly to illustrate this. Um, I, I was called by a family in another city, another time. They said our son has been into some weird stuff. Like, we don't know what he does in his room, but he goes out with these very, very strange people, and we hear noises and chants and all kinds of things going on. And we think that there's something really evil that's happening in his life. We think that he may actually have connection with demons or something like that. So what I said was, okay, I was with a couple of young adults. I said, guys, okay, guys, order pizza. This is going to take a while. Order pizza because we're going to get hungry, all right, first of all. And we'll be there in about an hour. And we, we walk into the room. I was running by myself, and this guy is on the edge of his bed, and he's rocking, and his eyes are glazed. He's rocking on the edge of his bed like this, and he instantly looks at me, and he says, I am so afraid of you. And I said, I said his name, and I said, I want you to understand something. It's not you that's afraid of me. It's the forces of darkness within you that are afraid of the person of Jesus Christ in me. And the fact that you feel that fear is actually because God loves you, and he is the powerful one who has died for you on the cross. And this is really simple. You just need to give your life to Jesus. I say, I say to him, do you want to be free? He says, I want to be free. I say, it's, it's simple. You need to submit your will to Jesus Christ. And the strong man will come into your house and everything else will leave. I say, just pray this, just pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I, I say, God, I want to ask you for forgiveness. God, I want to ask you for forgiveness. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Come into my life, Lord And he can't get Jesus out. I say, say, come into my life, Lord, Je Lord Jesus. Come into my life. And the demons just shut him down. So then I would call his dad and the guys that ordered pizza, and we hold him down. He was very strong. And we just sat on him for about half an hour. And his dad is screaming in his ear, just give your life to Jesus. Just give your life to Jesus, my son. Give your life to Jesus. You, you don't need to be dominated by these powers. Just give your life to Jesus. And finally, in this fight, 
he cries out, Jesus, save me. And instantly, he's just free. You see, it's simple. You don't need to name these powers and get some diviner and make a sacrifice and sort these out. Your house is always going to be divided. You just need to call on the strong man. And the strong man comes in and everyone else has to leave. You don't need a, a, a prophet to pray for you. You don't need holy water. You don't need a special book or a special course or those hour and a half long YouTube videos. You just need to call on the name of the strong man. And you need to make sure he's thoroughly in your house. Because when it's his house, nobody else can come in. This Jesus is creator, he is savior, and he is also deliverer. And so suddenly, this world that is so confusing and so insecure and never really gives you a resolution, hey, this guy, you know, we made a sacrifice because that guy was unhappy, and then there was this, and we got that pastor to pray, and you know, the guys in Durban, they're really powerful, better go to Durban. Suddenly, this world that's really, like, really confusing, suddenly it becomes peaceful, and you can focus on the stuff that God wants you to do. He wants you to live in victory. The devil wants you here confused and worried and anxious and powers and division and who did this and who said that and did I pray the prayer right and did I wave my hand right and did I use the water right and whatever. And the de- God just wants you to focus on your family and your school and your business and he wants you to live in peace because a strong man is in your house. He wants you to focus on the stuff that's important. Amen. Amen. The second thing that I want to talk about, and this is all I have time for today, is that this means that you have full authority. You have full authority in Jesus Christ. Um, And I want us to read in Acts chapter 19 and verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him and were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. Incredible. Incredible. Guys, Paul was just there. They gave him a handkerchief. They took the handkerchief to someone who had evil powers dominating their life, and they left. And he said, some Jews who were around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, that one, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And one day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, it came to over 50,000 drachmas, and in this way the word of the Lord spread and grew in power. These guys... uh, these seven sons of Sceva. So daddy was a priest. He was a holy man. This guy called Sceva. And he had seven sons. And they come against these evil forces. And they think that because their dad's a priest, they got something special. And then they realize, hey, this dude Paul and this kind of name of Jesus and these Christians, they have some sort of power there. So we're going to use it as well. So we're going to be like, did we pray the prayer right? Okay. Okay. My dad, hey, my dad's a priest. So, in the name of Jesus, did I say it right? Jesus, the one that Paul preaches, that one, come out of him. And the demon gives a very practical reply. I know this Jesus guy because he took me down on the cross. Okay, I know Paul because he belongs to Jesus, but I don't know you because you don't belong to Jesus. Very practical. And then they all leave naked and bleeding. You see, people want to understand authority as mystical power. Did I say the right words? Did I use the right prayer? Did I have the right prophet? Did I go to the right church? 
Did I, was it the right time? Was it between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m.? Uh, did I use the right passage of Scripture in the right order? Did I have the right charm? Whatever. And it's mystical power. And the demon gives them a better way to understand it. He says, this thing doesn't work by mystical power. It works by relational power. In other words, if Jesus Christ is in you and you are in relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not all of these techniques that you need to know. It's just the person of Jesus who has the authority. The authority is not in his name. You know, sometimes I see Christians praying like, you know, they feel like something evil is happening. They're like, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Let me just like, it's like a machine gun, you know, Jesus. As if that's going to take the devil down. You don't even need to say his name because his name is in you. Because he has brought you into a relationship with the Father. And the authority is not in your techniques or your prayers. That's going back into a place that gives us insecurity. Are we together? The authority is in the person of Jesus Christ. Stand your ground because Jesus is in you. You know, I, I met a guy who was in Zambia. We were in Zambia for a couple of weeks doing evangelism in some villages. Things are pretty crazy there, like in terms of demon possession. And yeah, you know, people get very, very sick um, because of demon possession, blind, children die, all kinds of things. Anyway, this guy, he's talking to me. We're in a village, so I've got a translator from Lozi to Bunda to English. <laughs> it's like four-way translation, you know, three-way translation. We're talking, I'm like, hey, just tell me your story. And he's like, he wanted to give some kind of testimony in this group that we were in. And he said, you know, um, I, just, I just made a decision to follow Jesus and give my life over to him about a month ago. And then what happened was my axe head got stolen by someone in the village. And in that context, a metal axe head is like the value of a car. It is so expensive. And so he, he went, he said, my, my whole family is doomed if I don't get this axe head back. So he went to the local diviner and said, I want you to find out who stole my axe head, because that's how he used to do it. And then the diviner said to him, um, he came back to him the next day and brought the money back and said, you tricked me. He said, I sent my, my spirits to your house. And they, they were looking for this person and this axe head, but I couldn't come anywhere near your house. Because there was another very powerful spirit that was guarding your house. Why did you trick me? Were you setting me up for failure? You should have told me that there was a powerful spirit around your house that, my, that was more powerful than my spirits. I can't find your axe head. You're, 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 you're rubbish. And he throws the money back at him. You see, this guy didn't even know how all of this stuff worked. But he didn't need to know because Jesus Christ was already at his house. So when people give you techniques and prophets and special things and all of this stuff, it's another strategy of the devil to keep you distracted and preoccupied when he's actually just a stoop blafferki, just a small dog at the house, and you need to say, yay! <laughs> Jesus is at my house. You can bark, maybe you can bite, but you won't cause me any real damage. Stand your ground! And I hope you're interpreting this in a, in a multitude of different ways. Some of you are doing business with a whole different ethical framework because you're Christians. And someone with a tender gets ahead of you. Or someone cuts you off. Or some political thing cuts in on you. Stand your ground. You're in a fight. Stand your ground. Don't get distracted. Take your place. Stand your ground. Stand on Christ. Pray with authority. Gather your team. Pray and ask God to deliver you from those powers that come against his kingdom. Take authority in the position of influence that Jesus Christ has given you. Because our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against powers and principalities. And so there's a very different way. This is quickly my third point as we close this meeting. There's a very different way for us to understand the spiritual battle as Christians, and again, this is an introduction. This, we are not fighting for victory. We are fighting from victory. That victory is Jesus Christ's death and resurrection on the cross. And just like when there's a war, and there's a warlord, and that warlord 
is defeated and imprisoned, the devil has been defeated and he has been imprisoned. He can still send commands from his prison cell and he still has rebel forces at work in this world, but he's, he's locked up, he's restrained by God's wisdom because he can't take free will out of the world because he created him and us with free will. That's another thought for you. The devil is locked up, he's restrained, his forces are still fighting, but his forces are fighting where, as forces whose leader has been locked up and restrained. They are fighting because they know they've lost the battle already. And it's one last desperate act to try and take down a few of the opposing side. We are not fighting to see who will win the battle. We are fighting because Jesus Christ has won the battle already. In Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. And we just, uh, Kerwin's going to come back up. And we are going to close by praying. If you've got a lot of questions, I want you to text them to 060-644-0857 if you've been joining us at home and you want us to address something in particular. Maybe it's a very personal question in this area. Please let us know so that we can address them during the course of this series. And um, maybe someone can just find me one, just one communion element. We're not going to break bread today because our box of communion that we had was actually expired, so we didn't want to serve that to you. But we normally end our service with communion. And that, that meal that we share is very, very important because of what the scripture says. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 21 says this. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons, and you cannot have a part both in the Lord's table and at the table of demons. When Jesus Christ invites us to his table, this is, this is the meal that we would usually celebrate, and you're gonna just receive this meaning today as we pray. We, we've got these two symbols. We've got bread baked without yeast, and Jesus gave this to his early disciples, a biscuit baked without yeast, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take it and eat it in remembrance of me. And then he had a cup of grape juice. In his case, it was wine. And he said, drink this cup and know that you, that I will drink it with you in eternity and I'm, I'm coming back for you. This is my blood shed for you on the cross and you covered it between you and God. And this means that Jesus Christ has placed you at the Father's table in the Father's family. Amen? Now, if I'm sitting down home to a family meal as we do and there's my, and an enemy comes and knocks on the front door and says, I want to come in and I want to take your daughter or I want to talk to your daughter I want to say something to your daughter. I want to say something to your wife. I don't send my daughter to the front door to sort it out. And I don't send my wife. I say, sit here at the table while I go and sort out this thing. And you carry on eating at the table, knowing that the battle is won outside. And that's why Paul says, when you sit at the table of Jesus Christ, you don't partake in anything that has to do with evil forces. Jesus Christ has died for you. And, and these powers, these powers, they always want blood from you. They want you to sacrifice something for them. But Jesus Christ has poured out his blood sacrifice for you. They always want something. Jesus Christ has given everything for you that you can sit in peace at his table. I just wanna, I wanna pray for anyone this morning that you feel like you're under attack. I wanna pray for anyone this morning that you feel like your life is disordered, it's disrupted. And this morning, I want you to understand it's not my prayer, it's the fact that Jesus Christ has seated you at his table and he has given everything that you will be safe and everything that you will live in victory in Jesus' name. Doesn't mean you're not gonna have battles, but you have them sitting at the table while he's fighting it outside. Amen. If you, want, if you want to be included in this prayer, I just want you to raise your hands for a moment and just give thanks to God. Just give thanks to God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. We are, we are just children in your family. Thank you for making us children in your family. Thank you for your incredible love for us, that you would come and rescue us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us into the kingdom 
of your Father, Jesus. You are a wonderful, powerful Savior. Thank you for seating us at his table. You prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies. You prepare a table for us in the presence of our enemies that we may eat and drink and rejoice in the Father's presence. Lord, we pray freedom over your people now this morning in Jesus' name. For anyone who is under attack, for anyone who is fighting on the forefront of a battle for the kingdom, we speak freedom over their lives from every evil power in Jesus' name. We thank you that as we eat and drink of his Holy Spirit, of his sacrifice for us, that your powerful victory is at work in our lives. And this is your word over your people this morning. Your word is victory, victory, victory in Jesus' name. Victory in every area of their lives. And I pray, Lord, that you place a holy confidence in every person now in Jesus' name. Give us confidence in your power. Give us joy and gratitude in your power knowing that whatever we come against, even this week, that we are fighting a battle that is actually yours. In Jesus' name.